Hi everybody, welcome to my second video about beams. In this video, I'm going to be introducing, explaining, and working through a simple example dealing with bending moment and shear force. So let's start with the definitions. A bending moment All right, so as I said here, a bending moment is an internal twist developed in response to an external load. So I'll show you what that is in an example after I give you the definition of shear. All right, and there you have it. There's a shear force, an internal force developed in response to an external load. So it's essentially the equivalent to a bending moment, except a bending moment has to do with torque and a shear force has to do with force. So let's take a look at a beam that we've made a cut in the middle and separated. Alright, so there we have it. Now let's assume this beam has been loaded beforehand by some sort of load. Let's just make it a constant applied load. Alright, now you can imagine that in response to these external loads, the internal bit is going to have to respond to make sure that it stays in equilibrium. Because if you recall, the definition of equilibrium of a certain structure is when every single part of that structure is in equilibrium. So we should be able to make an arbitrary cut anywhere in this beam and have the pieces that we didn't include in that cut on the side and that piece that we did include in the cut, that whole piece should be in equilibrium. And as you can see here, this piece is not in equilibrium right now because this force will cause it just to either you know, shear straight down or to twist around. So we need to develop an internal reaction in response to that, and that's exactly what we call a bending moment and shear force. So in this case here, this is going to want to twist this way. So the internal bit of wood here, I guess you could call it, is going to have to react and somehow produce a moment here. And we call that a bending moment, M. And on this side, we give it this direction of the symbol here, M. So no matter how you cut it, the convention says the moment is going to go from the bottom of the beam to the top of the beam. It's going to twist back. And if you have this sort of load, it's basically exactly how you would imagine it to be. Now for the shear force, for this side here, this external load is pushing down. So you say the shear force, drawn with this half arrow arrow here, we give that a symbol V, the shear force is going to point that way. And convention says that shear force for anything that's cut and having the piece to the left hand side exposed is going to be down. Now you might ask why is it done that way? When in reality it's actually going to be the other way. It's just to keep the convention straight and that's so later on when you start drawing uh, shear force diagrams and stuff that everybody knows what you mean. So this is the universal or as far as I know, universal standard. And if you know, you take these two shear forces, like this, this is basically twisting like this in a positive moment. All right, so this equals a positive moment. If you need something to keep that sort of reaction in mind. All right, so moving into what a bending moment diagram and a shear force diagram are. So 
just looking at this beam here, you can imagine that the shear force and the bending moment is not going to be the same at any point. All right, that only makes sense. If we would make that cut here on the beam, you would need a lot less bending moment to resist this piece here that's pushing down because there's not as much twisting it in this direction, so you won't need as much to push it back. And we can go through the same logic with the shear force. The shear force is going to vary. So let's take a look at a simple example, and I'll show you how to find the bending moment and the shear force in that beam at different points on that beam, and then I'll draw the bending moment and shear force diagrams. So here's the beam we're going to take a look at. All right, there we go. So this is simply support a beam with a single load in the middle. So the first step in any of these beam problems is going to be to find the reactions at the support. All right, no matter what the beam problem is, you need to know that because later on when you go to find equations describing the shear force and bending moment, you'll need to know those reactions. So always go about and find the reactions at the support first. So we can do that by making an overall free body diagram. All right, and there you have it. Each of these supports is going to give a reaction in this direction. And that's pretty well. We don't include the X direction here, even though there could be an X reaction there because there's no other X reaction along this support. So we just simply leave it out. I've also said that the reactions are the same. All right, if this P, this load, was not applied at the middle, they would be different. But you know, for this case, we're taking it to be the middle, so they're the same. If they were different, you'd have to do some of moments to find out what the reactions were. Anyhow, in this case, right there you have it. The reaction is half of the applied load there, P. All right, so now let's move into finding the shear force and the bending moment in this beam. So just like when we had torsional bars and axial bars, in order to expose the internal reactions. In axial bars we had internal reactions, forces, and in torsional bars we had internal torque developing, and here we have shear force and bending moment developing. We're going to expose them the same way by making an imaginary cut and then looking at what happens during that cut. And the same criteria we made in those axial bars and torsional bars for where to put the cut we're going to do here as well. And those criteria were you make a cut in a place where the conditions of that piece can be described by the same set of mathematical equations. So in other words, you know, in, in a piece where everything was constant. And we can see here in this piece, before we add P, what's happening in here is going to be the same. I could cut here, I could cut here, I could cut here, and whatever was developed in reaction to it would be the same because the conditions are the same. So I'm going to make my first cut here. I will look this way. And as we continue along our journey, oh, there's P. Something changed. I need to make a cut on this side. As we continue our journey, everything is the same until I reach the very end of the beam. So in this case, we need two cuts, one on the one side, one on the other side. All right, so if you're getting confused of where to put these cuts, think of what if it was an axial bar, then where I would make the cuts. There's a lot of similarity in beams as there was in torsional bars and axial bars. So let's take a look at this first one here. We'll call this one and this cut two. So I'll say FBD one. All 
Alright, and there you have it. Notice that I put my conventions in, I label which way I take my moment to be positive. So notice I've also followed the conventions here and put them in the same way as I label them down here. Now this is the shear force and the bending moment in the first piece. Alright, so I'm going to give it V1, M1. So later on when you have to make, you know, four, five, six cuts, it'll keep track of the separate pieces. Alright, so we can solve for all of these. And then you have a V1 is half of P. So anywhere along this piece, the internal shear force is going to be downwards of a magnitude P by 2. So let's go find the moment here. So I always like to take the sum of the moments around the cut edge, call it V1 to be 0. And the reason I do that and not here is because if I did it around here, I wouldn't have to include R, but then I would have to include V1. And I wouldn't know what V1 is, so I'd have to use my sum of forces to find what V1 is. Alright? But considering that, you know, everybody's human, everybody makes mistakes, there is a possibility that you could have done this piece wrong, and if you had done this piece wrong, and you use that information, you also get this piece wrong. So by taking the shear force out of the equation, by taking your moment sum about that point, you'll eliminate that source of error. Alright? So here we go. And the reason I call it x is because I made the distance, the cut a distance x away. Let's start x from the base. Alright. Alright, moving along. Let's get the second free body diagram happening from the second piece. All right, there you have it. I just want to point out here, I added the subscripts 2 and 2. Note that it was on the second piece, and note that P is now in there, because when I made the cut, it included P. All right, so we're going to do the same thing as we did before, some of the forces and some of the moments. Let's do forces first. Alright, and I got that just by rearranging this and then putting R as P by 2. And now for the sum of the moments, and before I do this, I'm of course going to take it around V2 to eliminate the need to use V2, and thereby reducing the chance of making a mistake. Before I do this, I just want to talk about some a convention that you can either use or not use. Because when we do moments, we need to define it by a distance X. Now you can take X to start from the base again and work all the way up to this point then you'll have an equation that depends on x, but you're not allowed to use the full range of x values because that equation of x doesn't apply between here and here, a distance l by 2 away. So you could develop an equation with x at the base, and then you just have to say, you know, it has some x limits, it has to be less than or greater than, you know, some arbitrary numbers. Alright? Or you can say x starts right where that condition changed, and make your x start here. Alright, and that's the way I like to do it. Alright, so there's advantages and disadvantages to both. It could be making your math a little bit easier to start x from the base, but then when you go to draw your bending moment diagrams, you need to think about where that's going to be, because your x is based at the zero, and you need to draw something out here. Whereas if your x is based here, and you're drawing your diagrams, you just start from where that point is, and then your Cartesian coordinate is centered right there. Okay, so you can use either way you want. I prefer to use this way here.
All right, and then we have it. Those are our four set of equations we need to describe the shear force and the bending moment at any point in this beam. So now let's go ahead and get into the shear force and bending moment diagrams, which is essentially just a graph of the shear force and the bending moment at different points. So let me redraw the beam and uh, show you the way I like to draw my bending moment diagrams. All right, so you can see I've sketched out two coordinate systems here. And this V with a circle, that's not voltage, all right? That's your shear force, and M is, well, the bending moment. So we're gonna go ahead and plot our shear force and bending moment on here. Now I just like to keep this diagram above here with all these kind of dotted lines describing where key things are going on. So in this case, I can also add the force there just to make my diagrams neater. So section one is this piece here. Section two, of course, is this piece here, all the way here. So V1, that's P by two. And V2 is negative P by two, as you can see from right here. So let's go ahead and plot that. All right, just like that. So basically, it's going along at p by two. You add p, the magnitude of this jump is p. All right, so let's go for the bending moment. At first, it's p by two x, so like a slope. Goes up to some point, it's a positive slope. And at x equals l by two, all right, the, turns out the magnitude of the bending moment here is p l by four. And that coincides nicely with what we have here. When x is 0, we have PL by 4, and then it goes down with a negative slope to 0. All right, and there you have it, your shear force and bending moment diagrams. Well, let's just notice here for a second. It seems to be that if you take the derivative of this, you're going to get this. Right? Because the slope of this is the magnitude of this. So it seems to be that dm dx equals v. And it turns out to be that that is the case. And this can come in, you know, in very important later and useful. But when you're doing your free body diagrams and you're finding your shear force and bending moment, don't use the fact that you know V to find M. Like don't just integrate it because there's a good chance you get it wrong because you need to solve for that plus C in your integration. And it's tricky to do that. All right, so that's my introduction to shear force and bending moment. They're the two most important topics I'd say in beams in this course so make sure you really understand what they are. I'll see you in my next few beam videos.